Howdy, it's Kyle with a video talking about the 10 best national parks for a multi-day visit. I previously posted a video talking about the best national parks for a one-day visit. Those are the parks that are either really small or ones where you can see a lot by just driving through the park and not getting very far from your car. So you don't have to go on a really long hike to see a whole lot. This video is about the parks that are on the opposite end of the spectrum. So these are either really large parks or ones where you're not going to see very much by simply driving through it and just going a little bit from your car. I'm going to start off by talking about the only national park that's in both of my videos. So it's good for both a one day visit and a multi day visit. And that's Yellowstone. If you've seen some of my other videos about national parks, you know that I love Yellowstone. It's one of my favorite, if not my absolute favorite national park in the entire country. It's good for a one day visit because you can drive through the park and see quite a few cool things just off the side of the road. But the park is so huge. There's so much more to see and you're better off by seeing it through multiple days. Because the geological features there are so awesome, it's a very popular park and it's just always crowded. So the best way to get away from the crowds is after seeing all that popular stuff on the first day, go back into the backcountry on a long hike on the second day. So even if there are a million people at the park on Labor Day weekend, you can go a few miles away from the parking lot and not see many people at all. But it's such a wonderful park, you want to see all of the main popular features like the Old Faithful Geyser and some of the other geyser bases. But Again, because it is so crowded, you're going to want to get away from people at some point. And the backcountry Yellowstone is wonderful. It's a great national park for a multi-day visit. The second national park I'm going to mention is Olympic National Park in the northwestern corner of Washington. This is such a huge park. It might take you a couple of days just to drive around it, but you certainly won't want to just drive. There's so many cool spots to see. And because of the geology of the park, there are a couple of very different areas of the park that are both worth seeing. A lot of the interior of the park is called the Ho Rainforest. This is a beautiful temperate rainforest. It's kind of like a tropical rainforest, but it's in the temperate climate and it's just so green. It's the wettest part of the contiguous U.S. So there's just so much rain, so many trees growing there. It's just gorgeous vegetation and a great spot to do some hiking. But there's so much more to the park than the rainforest. There's also the coastal area. This is absolutely gorgeous. So you're hiking right there along the coast. There's literally a backpacking trail along the beach. So you're you know, hiking along the coast. And it's really cool. This isn't, of course, the beach. You're going to be out there sunbathing because the water is going to be freezing. The temperature is probably going to be maybe in the 60s at the highest. So it's not that kind of beach. But it's a beautiful beach. And you'll definitely want to see it. So the park is just so huge. You want to see the rainforest on one day, the coast on another day. There's also a part of the park that has some natural hot springs and they've built a pool around it so you can sit in the hot water and just experience some natural hot springs. So if you've heard of that Blue Lagoon, that pretty famous spot in Iceland, it's kind of like that. So there's just so much to see at Olympic. You can see the rainforest one day, the coast one day, and sit in the hot tub for the third day. But go for at least two days. There's just so much to see at Olympic National Park. The third national park I'm going to mention is Glacier National Park in the northwestern part of Montana, right along the Canadian border. The park itself straddles the international boundary. So part of the park is in Canada. It's administered by the Canadian National Park Service, but it is still the same park, essentially. This is another park that's just so huge. It'll take you an entire day just to drive through it, but you'll want to see more than you can see just from the road. The going to the Sun Road is the main road through the park. It connects the eastern to the western entrance, and it's considered one of the most beautiful drives in the world, and it is. But it's very slow going, so there's a pretty good chance you'll be behind a tour bus or behind some cars that are behind the tour bus. So you're not going to go very fast. You're going to need probably half the entire day just to drive the going to the Sun Road, which you'll want to do. But just like pretty much all the other parks on this list, there's more to do than just drive to the park because you'll want to get back into the backcountry, do some hiking, and see some pretty cool stuff that you're not going to see from the side of the road. If you're there after Labor Day or before Memorial Day, then the going to the Sun Road isn't going to be entirely open. So if you're there, like when we were in early May, the road was closed in the middle of the park, but we were able to basically hike on the road itself. So the road became the trail because there's no traffic on it. So you might have to do that kind of thing if you're there in the off season. Of course, the off season there is most of the year, but Glacier is such a huge park. There's so much to see. You'll definitely want to get back in the back country and do more than just the going to the Sun Road. So you'll definitely need multiple days at Glacier. Heading back to my favorite state for outdoor activity, Utah. The next one on the list is Zion National Park in the southwestern corner of the state. It's a pretty popular national park for a one day visit. It's only about two hours from Vegas, so a lot of folks are going to, say, Vegas for the week, and maybe they'll take a day excursion to go to Zion, or maybe they're coming up for just a three-day weekend from, say, L.A. or San Diego or Phoenix, and they say, oh, we can do Zion one day and Bryce one day, too. Well, Bryce Canyon is a great NASA park for one-day visit, but Zion is not. You need more time than one day to see Zion. 
And the main reason for that is you can do a decent amount in just one day. You can drive through the park, see some pretty cool sights, go on a couple of short hikes that aren't very far from the side of the road. But why it's so tough to see in just one day is there's a completely other part of the park that a lot of folks miss. It's called the Kalob Canyon part of the park, and it's just really cool. It's a lot less visited. It's not the main part of the park, but there's some wonderful features there, some pretty cool stuff to see. And it's really worth getting out and doing some hiking at the Kalob Canyons part if the crowds at the main part of the park are just a little bit too much for you. But one day at Zion is, is okay. It, it wasn't quite enough to make my list of the top 10 best ones for one day, but you do need to spend a couple days there at least. It's a great park. It's a huge park. Spend more than one day there. Staying in Utah, the next national park on this list is Canyonlands, which is in the eastern part of the state near Moab. I have a really short video about this national park talking about why it's better than the Grand Canyon in my opinion, but it is a wonderful park. It's so huge. There are three sections to the park and you can't really see all of them in just one day, but you want to see at least two of these main sections. Just like most other national parks, this is a great one to just kind of drive through the park, see some pretty cool sights, do a couple of short hikes that aren't very far from the side of the road. There are some pretty cool arches you can see. There's a spot called the Whale Rock, which is right in the middle of the park. You just kind of go up on this giant rock and you can see a lot of the park from this high vantage point, which is pretty cool. The Grand Viewpoint near the Willow Flat Campground is just a wonderful spot to get some nice peace and quiet and see some gorgeous canyon scenery. And I've been there several times. I hardly ever see people on these trails I go on, so it's just kind of quiet. You might see some people at the Mesa Arch or some of the other popular spots that aren't very far from the road, but most of the park, you get back a mile or two, you're not going to see many people back there, so it's a great park for some solitude. The main part of the park is called the Island in the Sky, and just like Zion, it's not the only part of the park, so that's why I think you have to go for more than one day. And you can see quite a bit in one day just by staying in the island in the sky section, but the park is so big, you'll want to go to one of the other two sections for at least a day as well. The one that's easier to visit is called the needle section, and it's named after all these kind of needle formations you're going to see, which is really cool, really easy to get to, but it's very lightly visited, even less so than the island in the sky section. And if you're super adventurous, the best part of the park to visit is called the Maze District, and this is just a giant maze of canyons, and it's called that because you might get lost. It's about as far removed from society as you can get in the contiguous 48 states. If you want to get way back in there, get some serious solitude, this is the place to do it. Now this section isn't for the faint of heart or for outdoor novices. There's some pretty serious hiking and backpacking trails and you might need a four wheel drive vehicle with decent clearance to even get down there in the first place to start your hiking, but it is some pretty serious solitude and some pretty serious wilderness. So if you're into that, I do recommend spending at least one or two days just in the maze itself, but even if you don't want to go to the Maze District, spend a day in the Island in the Sky and a day in the Needles District. It's wonderful. Canyonlands is a great national park for multiple days. The next park I'm going to talk about is Yosemite National Park in the Sierra Nevada in California. It's one of the most highly visited national parks in the entire country, so of course it's going to be busy. And because it's in California, the weather is nice for a longer portion of the year, so you're going to see big crowds for a higher percentage of the year. But just like Yellowstone, you'll want to see the main things that draw the people there in the first place. You'll want to see Yosemite Valley, Yosemite Falls, and Bridal Veil vale Falls, and some of the main things you can see in just that really popular part of the park where everybody goes. But the park is so huge. There is so much backcountry, Yosemite. There is so much more to see than the valley. So you definitely want to get out of your car and get pretty far back on the trail to get the most out of the park. There are a couple of parts of the park that people think might not be that busy, but really are. And the first is Half Dome. People think, well, there won't be that many people going up the top of Half Dome. Well, no, there's a ton of people there. There might be a line even. So the other part of the park that might be really busy, you might not be expecting, is the High Sierra Trail. Do know that the High Sierra Trail isn't going to be as secluded as you might think. You might look at it and be like, oh, this is a super long trail. There won't be anybody on this. But there are all kinds of access to it and off of it. So it's kind of like the Appalachian Trail. So not many folks do the whole AT, but there are all kinds of people that hop on and off and just do short sections. So it's kind of the same as the High Sierra Trail where you won't see that many people doing the entire thing, but if you're just doing say 10 miles of it, you might see a group of different people at different sections that are just doing a couple of short stretches of it. And if you want to see some of those giant sequoia trees, there are plenty of them to see in Yosemite. You won't see anywhere near as many as you do at Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park a couple hours south, but if you're only able to do one national park and you're going to Yosemite, then you still can see some pretty big trees. So do the main stuff on one day, the valley, all that kind of crowded stuff, and get back in the backcountry on the second day, you'll get the most out of your visit to Yosemite. 
Next up is Grand Canyon National Park in northern Arizona. And in another video, I took a little bit of heat in the comments section because I mentioned that if you only have a day to visit the Grand Canyon, I don't really recommend it. And I stand by that. It really is a national park, but you really need multiple days to see it. Because the crowds are so large, you may have to wait for 10 minutes to get a picture at a certain viewpoint because there's a bunch of other people that want to get a picture at that exact same viewpoint. Or you might go to the visitor center. It might take you 10 minutes in line to buy a t-shirt. Or you're waiting for 15 minutes to get on the shuttle bus. Or you're stuck in bumper to bumper traffic kind of stuff. So things will take a lot longer at Grand Canyon than you might expect. So it'll take you an entire day just to see the South Rim, the main part of the park. But you want to see a lot more than that. The best way to see the park is to hike to the bottom of it to get away from the crowds and to see the best scenery. And to do that, you really have to do it in multiple days. Now, I know a couple of trail runners that have gone down there and ran to the bottom and ran back up, but they're what you call crazy. You should not do that. It's just for fitness only, which is fine. But if you're just doing it for fitness, you're not really getting the whole scenery and the whole NASA park experience out of it. So take multiple days to go to the bottom of the canyon, spend a couple days down there, and then take your time getting back up to the top. The most popular trail is the Bright Angel Trail, and that's the one that has a lot of people on it. That's the one where you'll see the mules going down there. So you might have to avoid the mules, get out of the way when they go by. But the other trail is called the North Kaibab Trail, and that's the one that I took to get to the bottom. That's a lot less busy, but a little more strenuous. And when you get to the bottom, there's a campground at the end of the Bright Angel Trail where you can set up camp right there. But even if you don't want to hike to the bottom of the canyon, I still do think it's worth a multiple day visit because one day is probably going to be spent at the South Rim area, which is the really crowded, crazy part where you'll be shoving people left and right. But you can spend another day at the North Rim area, which is still going to be pretty busy, but nowhere near as busy as the South Rim. So I'm going to reiterate what I said in another video. I think the Grand Canyon is not a great national park for a single day visit, but it is a great one for a multiple day visit. The next park on the list is Big Bend's National Park in southwestern Texas. When most people think of Texas, they aren't thinking about this. This is some gorgeous scenery, some beautiful big mountains right along the Mexican border. It would be an okay national park for a one-day visit if it weren't for one big thing, and that is it's about two hours away from the closest decent-sized town. So unless you're camping, you'll be staying in one of those towns, and it'll take you two hours one way, two hours back. That's half your day just getting to and from the park, and you won't have much time to really see anything in the park. So on one day, you can visit the main parts of the park. You can drive from the northern end to the southern end of the park, which is at the river and the Mexican border. And you can go on a couple of short hikes that aren't very far from the road. But if you're going to Big Bend, there's a pretty good chance you want to see the river itself. So if you want to do some hiking, you won't have enough time to do both that and the river. So you can do some canoeing and kayaking or go on a guided rafting trip through the park right on the river, which is the international border through some gorgeous canyons. And there's even a part where you can cross the river into a tiny little Mexican town called Boquilla del Carmen. It's not even connected to the rest of Mexico by road. It's only accessible from the river at Big Bend National Park. So that isn't really the National Park itself. But if you're down there, I think it really is worth going across the river to see. I don't recommend going there in the middle of summer. I've been there in the summer one time and it was pretty brutal. I didn't really feel like doing much hiking there. But if you go in the winter, early spring or fall or something, it's going to be pretty nice there and great for getting out might be a little bit chilly there, but that's great when it's a little bit chilly when you're doing some hiking. But because it is so far from the nearest town and even farther from the nearest interstate, it's a very lightly visited national park. It's just so far out of the way for doing a cross-country road trip. And even though I do think it's worth going out of that way to do it, most people don't. And the last two national parks I'm going to mention in this video are both in the eastern half of the U.S. and are quite a bit different than the other ones mentioned in this video because in order to see it for multiple days, you have to be in a boat. The first of those is Everglades National Park in the southwestern corner of Florida. It is a huge national park. It's one of the biggest ones in the country, even though most of the park is inaccessible swamp. I've only been there one time, and it was for one day, and I was like, man, I need to get back in the water because there isn't a whole lot you can do there. I drove through the entire park. There's a couple of spots you can do some short boardwalk trail type things, but you really can't see that much. So the best way to do it is to get in a canoe and kayak and paddle your way through the park. If you're in a canoe or a regular kayak, you can paddle through the middle of the park on some established water trails. And if you're doing a multi-day canoe or kayak camping trip, there are these things called chickies that stick out of the water so you can camp on top of it without being in the water without having to worry about alligators crawling into your tent at night. If you have a sea kayak, you can paddle around the outside of the park. So you're basically paddling around the coast of Florida, which is probably pretty cool. And you can camp on chickies, but on the beach. You can just paddle right by. Set up your tent right there on the sand and then head out the next morning. 
I'm a canoeist. I don't have a kayak. So I would love to do the interior part of the park where you're going to the water trails and camping on the chickies. But you will need multiple days to do this. You can't really see much of anything in Everglades in one day. Spend multiple days there. And the last national park I'm going to mention in this video is the hipster one of all. It's the one that no one's heard of. And that is Isle Royal National Park in the middle of Lake Superior off the shore of northeastern Minnesota. As the name implies, it's an island and the only way you can get there is by a ferry or by a little seaplane. I haven't actually been there, but it is one of the top national parks I'd like to visit, but you really can only do it in a multiple day visit. I guess technically you could go for just one day, take the ferry in the morning, do what? I don't know, but then take the ferry in the afternoon back, but you really won't be able to see very much. You need multiple days to really see it. You can hike or backpack across the island, or you can canoe or kayak across it as well. And just like the Everglades, if you have a sea kayak, you can go along the outside. If you have a regular kayak or a canoe, you can go through the middle of the park. But it'll take several days to do this. There's no way you can do this in one day. So you need to spend at least two days there and probably three or four to make it a fully good paddling camping destination. And it's one of the least visited national parks in the country because it's way out there in Lake Superior. It takes a boat or a plane to get to it and you can only do it for a few days. So most Americans aren't going to be doing that. You'll have a lot of the park to yourself. And if you go when I want to go, which is in September after Labor Day, there really won't be anybody there at all. Generally, in my videos, I don't like to talk about places I haven't been to, but this is a little bit different because I know what I have to get myself into to visit it. You'll need multiple days to either backpack or paddle across it, and you just can't do it in one day. So if you want to see Isle Royale, you need multiple days. So that's my list of the 10 best national parks for a multi-day visit. If you're on a cross-country road trip and you want to see national parks, do note that the ones in this video are going to require more than one day to get the most out of it. If you want to see the largest number of national parks possible and or you don't have much time to spend at each one, check out my other video talking about the 10 best national parks for a one day visit. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And if you're interested in stuff about U.S. geography, cross-country road tripping, comparing places to each other, ranking things, well, this is the channel for you, so go ahead and subscribe. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.